Well, now let's turn to uh, Steve Sherrill, who is going to give us a real education, again, on battery power. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, tonight we are going to kind of uh, go over some things and maybe we can answer some of the questions that you had last week. I've called on my good friend, Bob Gelmacher, who is going to have a presentation. And so, Bob, if you are there. I'm here. OK. OK. Anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about dead rail today at battery powered. And um, come on, guys. OK. And I listened to the conversations that we've had in the last week or so. And I think we have to set some expectations before we go any further, because some of the information may have been misleading, and I'm not sure that this is a universal solution for everything. Uh, there is a sweet spot for the application, and the application that Steve has put forth is an application using a fairly inexpensive RF uh, radio frequency car and its controller. Uh, and that particular set of technology is great if you're gonna run a small engine, I run ON30, so I'm talking about a small engine like a Porter or something like that. But I know a number of the guys have larger systems, they have O scale and the RF car is not probably not gonna be applicable for uh, you know something that big because it's just gonna draw too much current. Now there are solutions out there that use RF and uh, dead rail for something like O scale or S scale but it's gonna be a lot more expensive, I think. And Jim, I think you actually mentioned the other day, I think it was a conversation like you said, can I for $35 get my engines up and running? Now, do you model O scale? Yes. Okay, um, then that probably wouldn't work for you, tell you the truth. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I say batteries not included, and I'm really not talking about the batteries that are required for the system, it's that, there's a lot of other things that have to happen uh, when we go to the battery operated system. And that's that you have to take the car apart. You have to basically cannibalize the car for the receiver. Uh, you have to get a battery. And I'm gonna show you in a couple of weeks how we cannibalize the handheld controller in order to make a controller that we're more or less uh, used to. Um, and the results may vary uh, depending on the scale that you're modeling, depending on the motor that's in the particular engine that you have. Uh, again, any given radio receiver might not work for any given engine. So it's gonna be a trial and error type of thing. It's not really plug and play. Um, light speed operation may have to come to an end. On a lot of these units, uh, they're running on like 3.5, uh, maybe under five volt batteries. Most of our engines probably like to see 12 volts. So the way that I can judge how fast things are going to go if we went to a battery operation would be if I took a, a standard off the shelf type of Bachman power supply and I set it to five volts and then try to run one of my ON30 engines, that would give me a fair idea of the maximum speed that I could get out of uh, a radio operated control. Now, again, uh, more expensive units are going to have higher uh, voltage, which would allow us to get up to the type of speed that you would see if you were running your engine at 12 volts. But I think for the inexpensive uh, system that Steve is talking about and going to show us a little bit later, uh, it's going to be low speed and it's going to be small trains. And that for an ON30 operator like myself, that's fine. Uh, but I'll tell you, I have some guys in our club that like to run their trains almost at light speed and this would never work for their type of operation. Let me move down my slideshow here. And I mentioned before that it's not a plug and play type of technology. It's so that when you go into this, it's not like you could take it out of the box, plug it right in and have it up and running. You have to go through, you have to cannibalize the uh, car, like I said before, and then do a little bit of wiring. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show is uh, a couple of different scenarios. Number one, our typical DC operation is we have a motor that sits in the engine. Uh, and of course, we all know that in DC, 
the voltage is coming across the tracks. It's picked up in contacts that are uh, on the wheels here, or it might be wheels in the tender, and then it's fed directly to the motor. So the motor is getting direct DC type of, of signal. When we go to DC operations, it's a little bit different. Again, a signal is coming through the tracks and it's picked up by the contacts, but this time that DCC signal is actually going to the DCC decoder. And the decoder is then actually feeding a signal to the motor. And in all the systems that I've read about, that signal is something called pulse width modulation. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. It's still a DC signal of sorts, but it's not a straight DC that you would see out of a standard DC power pack. And then when we get into dead rail or battery operation, things change a little bit again. This time there's no voltage, there's no current coming through the tracks themselves. Everything is done via uh, RF radio frequency from the handheld receiver that you have or handheld transmitter into the RF receiver that's sitting in the tender or a pull behind car. In this case, all the power to run the engine is really gonna come through a battery that's gonna be sitting probably either on top or right behind that receiver. Uh, a little bit of the voltage is gonna be consumed by the receiver to make the electronics go in it. But again, like DCC, the RF receiver is gonna pull in the signal, interpret that signal, and then passes again, pulse width modulated signal to the motor. And I'm gonna talk about uh, PWM in just a minute. But the power is supplied by that onboard power, uh, battery for both the motor and the receiver. Okay. Um, in all three cases, the motor in the locomotive is all, it's a DC motor. Doesn't matter. It's always a DC motor. And it's really controlled by the signal. And those signals are going to be different depending on the technology that we're going to employ. Now, I talked about uh, pulse width modulation before. And I don't know how much you all know about this, but uh, on the DCC decoder and also on the receiver, there's a little computer chip on there, a little chip, and that DCC decoder or receiver is capable of receiving a signal from, uh, let's say, a controller itself, and then it can actually take an out pulse to the motor pulses as compared to a straight DC. Uh, and now I have a picture here that shows the various widths. Now, these pulses could be coming at like a thousand times a second or even higher than that. But depending on this width will depend on how fast the motor or the motor is going to turn. For instance, in the upper case, the width is, uh, is uh, very, very small as far as the time width goes. And there's no voltage at all that's gonna be going through the motor. As we go down this chain, you can see that the pulse width is getting a little bit wider and wider and wider, and they call these duty cycles. And what happens is, is the wider this pulse is, the more power is then gonna be pushed out to the motor. As it turns out, the input voltage is always gonna be the same, but because we're not feeding that voltage to the motor continuously, the average power or the average voltage that that motor is seeing is going to be smaller and less uh, depending on how narrow this pulse is. So if we had a, a three volt motor or if we had a, uh, a 12 volt motor and we were pushing out uh, a maximum of four volts if we would or five volts, uh, that would mean that that motor could not turn as quickly as if we were pushing just 12 volts at it. Uh, that pulse width modulation capability is built into all these chips and usually needs absolutely no programming by the modeler. Uh, it's ready to go. Only thing we have to do is control the input, which then tells the receiver or the controller exactly how fast they want to put out these pulses. Um, some of the benefits of the dead rail, and these are the big pluses, is that first of all, there's no track wiring required at all because everything is actually encapsulated in the tender. There's no wheel cleaning, there's no track cleaning. The wiring for frogs and reverse loops is virtually eliminated. And it's relatively inexpensive for small locomotives. Uh, like the one guy said last week, he's got a lot of brass engines. And especially if you're running large O scale, uh, then this solution is probably not gonna work for you because it just doesn't put out enough power. Even in my ON30 world, 
and uh, it's questionable whether or not I can actually run the moguls using the uh, system that comes out of the cars. Now, I could probably go out and buy a radio controlled car that might run at a higher voltage. I could buy a radio controlled system that is used for airplanes. Um, and if they're running at higher voltages, that's gonna give enough kick for my moguls to work. But for right now, I'm considering battery powered dead rail only for my smallest engines and also to run small trains. So that's just kind of an introduction. I'll take any questions that anybody might have. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve and he's gonna give us an equipment demo. I have a question. You say that it works only for the smaller locomotives. So does that mean it might work for HO or S? Uh, yes. yes, I mean, I think the motors in an HO engine, motors in a uh, uh, the ON30, they're all relatively the same size. I think they're all gonna run off of around 12 volts. So I would think that you probably could run an HO engine using the um, RF car scenario, but uh, I would probably buy one and test it before you went out and bought 20 to equip your entire fleet. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Well, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve. Thank you, Bob, thank you. I'm glad you were listening when I explained that to you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> uh, good. <laughs> Put me back on the screen. I don't, I don't see me. Phil, can you put way, me? While we're, while we're waiting for Steve, did Ethan ever show up? Does anybody know if Ethan is online? Ethan, Ethan you're there. Ethan was here, but he had to leave before 7.30. Okay, I'm going to see Steve, I mean, Steve, Ethan over at the Timonium show on uh, Saturday. And I have a bunch of scenery material that I'm going to uh, kind of donate to his cause. Bob, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I, no, I it's really okay. Also, I don't know if anybody knows it, but Bob also is the, uh, the senior clinician for, uh, uh, pardon me, I forgot the company. Scenic Express. Scenic <laughs> Express. I did, I did it to Steve too. Scenic <laughs> Express. And, and he has been kind enough in a future shows, he's going to show us how to use scenery at, as the as the way to set the stage for the for the trains to go through, and I, I think that's a unique way of talking about scenery. And Bob, I really do appreciate you wanting to do this. Oh, that's okay. And I'll I'll, I'll talk for just a minute on that um, because I work for Scenic. I get a chance to see all the new products that come out. Um, and all the products that are there. And I have a feeling that some of those products don't get as much exposure to uh, all of us as they could. And some of them are really great. Uh, so what I plan to do is I plan to take a couple of segments and take maybe one or two products per segment and talk about how you use it, how I use it, and you know what you can do with that. And uh, hopefully that, uh, you know, it might uh, shed some light on some new avenues for you guys to use uh, when you're building your railroads. Fantastic, I think that sounds great. Hey, uh, there's a question from one of our YouTube viewers. Uh -huh. They're asking if we can use a setup like this in N scale. Yes, okay. the, only problem, the only problem that I would see is now all of a sudden there's a size factor. And in, uh, I think, HO, and I know in ON30, uh, if you can't fit the receiver and the battery actually in the engine, then you can always have a pull-behind car, like a, I, I made some water tenders, uh, uh, printed some water tenders for ON30, uh, or you could put a box car or a gondola behind the engine and house that stuff there. I don't know how easily it would be to house the battery and receiver in an N-scale a uh, piece of rolling stock. It, 
Okay, what you see here is- Bob, let me, Bob, let me ask you one question before we, before we get off this subject. What about S scale? Um, well, size would not be a factor there because you know there's plenty of room uh, in, a, let's say, an S scale tender. Again, I would probably want to test the motor in that uh, and see how the motor is compatible with the system that Steve's going to show us. My gut feeling is is that there's probably enough not enough power in this small radio receiver to run an S scale engine. Gotcha. And I think you're going to have to go for something a little bit uh, more commercial to do that. So really, what we're talking about, what Steve is going to show us, really. Is, is going to be appropriate for N and HO. N, HO, ON30. Yeah, I, that, that's my feeling. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Everybody saw the uh, race car, the RC car that I uh, actually showed in the first segment. Um, after you take the shell off, all this stuff is exposed. And you, you, you just of uh, unscrewing little screws and taking the protective covers off and you get, here's a receiver, here's a connector, here is an on off switch, which connects to the battery or intercepts the battery circuit so that you can turn the power off so it's not active all the time. Um, it's not a real clear picture here, but there's actually a socket right down there that you can plug in a light. The problem with this inexpensive unit is you can't turn the light off. So when you disconnect these two wires here from the motor, which, which makes the race car go forward and backward, you then you solder them to your motor here on the plus and minus side. And then now you're ready to go. So this took me about, you know, however it took for the soldering iron to heat up to get this going. Now, um, this was the, the engine that I went to the train show last weekend and purchased. Okay, I showed you that engine last, last time. Now, um, here, here is the... Let me get this a little better. Here's everything into a trailing car. What I've done here is this is the same engine. I just put an Owen 3040 um, cab on it. And th this is a um, Bob Gelmacher owns Carroll County Scenics. And this is a five board. Uh, 3D printed, gone, that I have everything in here. Now, the problem we have with the stuff that comes out of the race car is, this is probably 18 gauge wire, which is not very flexible. So what I will do is go back in here, replacing these connectors with much smaller ones, with wire that's much more flexible, so I can, uh, it will be entirely underneath a coal load in this, gondola um let me see something here now anyway i don't have a very good picture the uh i, I what i did like i put this all together and i tested it around my railroad uh, so i have to like really squeeze things together so it doesn't catch on any of the rock formations or buildings or anything like that so um, this is it was a very simple conversion. You know, this is just a pipe, you know, a pipe cleaner or a straw that I put in there to make that go. So, unfortunately, I had a Wi Fi problem, so I can't even show you how slow it runs and how much how easy it is to control this. So, um, so are there any questions on any of this that we've covered tonight? Yeah, I got, I got a question. Okay. I've got the engine. Um, I've got the motor and the locomotive. Okay. Haven't touched that, haven't done anything to that except put the two wires to it, right? Yeah. 
when I took the car apart, I salvaged what you call a receiver mm -hmm. oh. and, and the battery. Yes. So what I've got in the gondola is the battery with an on-off switch. Mm -hmm. I've got, and I've got a what you're calling a receiver. This right that, here. That takes that battery power and makes the motor operate. Because it's getting a signal from the transmitter, which is, looks like a pistol grip. Okay. But that's not in the gondola. No, no, that's separate. It's, it's like you holding that thing that you have to. But I'm not talking about anything except what's in the gondola. Okay. If, if you turned that on right now, it wouldn't do a thing. Okay. We'll do, we'll do nothing. Hey, Jim, Jim, let me, this is Phil. Let me explain. I think it's simpler. So an R, RC car has two controls, right? You push the button and it goes faster or slower. So that's running the motor faster or slower. And then right. it's got a knob and you turn that and that moves the wheels back and forth so you can steer. But clearly steering in a locomotive is irrelevant. So you just ignore that. Basically, all Steve is doing, and it's brilliant. Don't get me wrong. It's, and it's his simplicity is brilliant is he's taking the circuit board that feeds the motor in the car. Right there. Taking it out of the car and connecting it to the motor in the locomotive. So the whole system thinks it's still running a car, yeah. but it's connected to a motor on a locomotive. So there are two pieces to do that. You got to take that little circuit board out and you got to take the battery. And those are the two things that come out of the car and get moved over. But it's all, it's all connected together. I can it's take all put it all together. You just, yeah, you just take it all out. It's literally, literally like, it's literally like yeah. taking the car away from the motor and adding the engine back around it. Right. When I, when I take the protective coverings off of the motor, which is something so the kids, you know, don't get in there and, and swallow or whatever they do. Um, and I, this right here is actually connected to a motor, which is very similar to the, Owen 30 motors used in the Davenport. It almost looks exactly like it. And then um, it, it's, it's in a linear form, okay? It, this is, it's, it's about six, uh, six inches long. And what I, what I do then is I disconnect this from the motor that's in the RC car and replace that motor with the motor in the little diesel unit here everything else, there's nothing else changed here this is just like it came out of the rc car everything here is the same and all of that goes in the gondola oh yes yes all of that in the see all that is in this gondola here now yeah I will go back in and, and make smaller gauge wire here, smaller gauge, so I get more flexibility and it will actually lay down there and you won't, you'll never see this again. Right. I will replace a, you know, I will upgrade the, these fittings right here, all this, and I will use a smaller battery that is going is, to, is flat. It's not, does not have as, as uh, it will not run it as long as this one. This one has uh, 600 milliamps, and the one I'm going to put in there has 250. So obviously, it's going to run a third of the time. Okay. So when you when you when you go into different scales, you you run into space situations, space in tenders, space in the locomotives, even space in trailing cars. So if you get into n scale. This, this will not work. You would have to go to a different RC car, <coughs> which is gonna have, have the same stuff probably, but it's gonna be smaller. Some of the, um, the little micro mini cars would probably have something that would work for N scale, but may not have as good as control. 
um, you know, it, it, the, the amount of um, control as far as the speed, the ESCs, electronic speed controls are called, would uh, vary, okay? So you might not have as much control. Now, these ha they have used this in HO and 3, but there are other systems which are can be used that are smaller, which can go in the smaller scales. Obviously, space is a situation in N scale. Now, N scale has DCC and sound already in it. So um, we could probably maybe substitute a battery and run it right into that, depending on what it is. Um, some of these systems, like balloon armies and things like that, are kind of, um, I'm going to say, a DCC based system. In my experiments, I tried to use um, these uh, batteries into straight DCC boards. And what it is, the, the batteries put heat through that system and burned up the boards. You'd have to have some other kind of electronic device to offset that heat. These boards would only take so much heat in them, you know, before they'll just burn up. But I've tried a lot of things. I've had some failures. But this is the absolute basic. And um, you need, for what you need, Jim, is the next step up. And that could be, you know, next week we're going to have loco fi on. It could be a loco fi si system. Um, it could be other systems, but you need more voltage because you, you're probably in a in a brass or in a, an older engine, which is going to draw more current. And if, if 3.7 volts won't run it, then this system will not be um, effective for you. Now, you may have some streetcars and trolleys that are smaller that don't draw as much as some of the, the larger units that you have which would possibly work for you, you know, they won't be very going very fast because of the power. You know, if they're set up to run 12 volts, you're only gonna run 3.7 through. Obviously you're not gonna be turning that motor as many revolutions as, as uh, 12 volts, so. so is is 3.7 the most, in other words, the battery that comes in the car is the biggest battery you could put with that system. Now, don't big. No, let's get relates more. To more the, is the most powerful battery you could put with that system. Eight point seven volts is the most voltage you can put through that particular board. Got it. Got it. Okay. And and that and that would run about a a fourth of speed of the twelve volt DC. Yeah, probably. Gotcha. Okay. Now, I mean, you know, some of these, like this thing here, if you open it up and go like 150 miles an hour. Sure. Okay. Because that's the type of motor that's in there. You know, it doesn't draw any current at all. So if you put 3.7 volts in, it's going to just fly around there. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, and what you have is, you, you have a larger motor, probably. Without seeing it, I, I really can't, you know, tell you yeah. what you have. Um, but as Bob, as Bob suggested, put it on the track and turn it down to, to the track until it just starts moving or gets a speed that you like, you know, and see how many volts. Take it or off. Just, or put your voltmeter or put your voltmeter on the tracks. Right. Turn the volts up to 3.7 and see the speed. Because right. that'll be your maximum speed. Got right. it. Got it. And if you can live with that, then but, this system works for you. Uh, a lot gotcha. of people like to run their trains quicker. By the way, I was I was looking out on uh, uh, Amazon and eBay, and I don't know whether you all have seen those controllers that people have. They're about this big, and you usually hold them in two hands, and you use both thumbs. That system looks interesting. It looks like it was about $60. I think that runs at a higher voltage. It's got a much bigger receiver in there, but it's also got like 10 functions. 
So that might be a, something that you know could be adapted for a uh, a larger engine. Matter of fact, I got one sitting in the back. I I started taking it apart. It's got like four or five potentiometers in it, so it's got some promise. Yeah. So so what would be really interesting is the blue to is the blue Nami as a comparison, because I mean for somebody like Jim, what that he can do then is take his DC powered layout two or three engines that he really loves, put a blue NAMI in them, control them from his tablet, and have sound for those mm -hmm. three engine, two or three engines. And you know, the cost structure is probably by the time you get to those more expensive cars and controllers, if you go to the kind of the next level of car where they're not a prepackaged box thing, but you're buying a car and you're buying a motor and you're buying an RC control circuit and you're buying the handheld controller. You know, the people that do this that are much more, that stuff gets a lot more expensive, I think. Well, um, LocoFi is coming on next week. And LocoFi is another option, too. So both LocoFi and Blue Nami enable you to have a locomotive that all it needs from the tracks are power. Yeah. Now, you, you, you so, know, so, so, well, so, you know, if you take, but, but here's the thing. So if you take 12 volts off the track and you run it through a heavy duty 10 amp rectifier, and you throw a huge, you know, you got a, you're putting a trolley together, so you could put a fairly heavy duty keep alive on it. I mean, you've got you've got something that probably ignores most of the dirty track that you might have. But if you're running DC, you're keeping your track relatively clean anyway. Yeah. Right. So that I mean, and this is the interesting thing. I mean, the beauty of I think what 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 Steve has done, he's made a way for somebody to go 100 percent wi wireless, 100 percent wireless in their layout for very low cost. Um, but but if you've got a bunch of DC engines and your wide layout is already wired for DC, then converting everything to wireless so you can ignore your wiring probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you you know clean your track up with you know mineral spirits, put no ox on it, and then have keep alive the locomotives, you're gonna get very good performance. And I, I think it's a cost structure thing of what it costs you to do it in terms of effort and and outcome and then the cool thing is now when you run those trolleys for your guests you're running them with sound yeah and that's the other thing is it, it depends on how important sound is to you yeah i mean i have all my stuff equipped with um tsunamis now but i've had a chance to run on steve sherrill's layout and also steve fisher's layout where there's no sound at all and it's not bad yep. and that's a sacrifice i'm willing to make uh, in order to avoid the wiring and the uh, all the other issues that you might have with, uh, you know, uh, a DC or DCC system. Let me ask you this: Is the does the D, let, let's say that you're using HO uh, scale small engines, small motors. So the the race car, the race car system might work for that size locomotive. Does it make a difference whether that is straight DC versus DCC? In other words, it, it, it would doesn't having, make, would it having, doesn't, would it having doesn't make from, from the motor standpoint, Jim, because it, they're both DC in both cases, whether it's a DC layout or DCC, the motor is still a DC motor. But but I'm talking about the voltage that the ba battery produces. The, the battery produces 3.7 volts. Is that uh, is DC better at that voltage than DCC? Is what I guess what I'm trying to. Add. In other words, does DCC take that 3.7 and knock it down to a three, where the straight DC leaves it at 3.7? There's always going to be a little bit of a voltage drop in the electronics associated with, let's say, a decoder or a uh, RC, RF receiver. Just the nature of the beast. It has to be powered in order to work. But, 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 but Jim, I, I, I'd be really, really careful because the question you asked needs some real clarification. DCC yeah. is two things. It is a defined power signaling level on track. What it says is we're going to put 15, we're going to put something around 14 to 16 volts on the track. 
Mm -hmm. And that signal is going to basically drop up and down. And the timing of those pulses is the sending of messages to decoders. So when you, when you hit the horn button on your, on your, your cab in DCC, you hit the horn button, a signal gets sent back to the base unit. The base unit is sending out this DCC signal on the wire that powers the locomotives, but it also has data in it. It then sends out there and says, engine 110, blow your horn. And that little packet goes out there and everybody sees it, but engine 110 says, I'm going to do something with it. That's what DCC is. Motors always run on DC. Right. They're AC motors, but, but they run on DC. And so when motors run on DC, what the DCC decoder does is it takes that input signal that says, make your motor output 50%. And it outputs to the motor, but this is the thing, it's very hard in electronics to build a circuit that adjusts voltage linearly. That's very, very, very difficult. That's why they have what you What you do in electronics is you do it differently. In DC, let's say you, you turn your locomotive all the way up. It has 12 volts on the wire. On your DC, when you turn it down to half, the voltage drops to six. So the energy your locomotive gets is six volts all the time. What PWM does is it says keep it at 12 volts, but if you want half the power, half the time, cut it to zero and then turn it back up. And it does that very fast, like 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 times a second. The result is the motor sees essentially the same amount of power as six volts. So that's how these things work. The, and, and the point is there are two kinds of circuit. The DCC circuit generates that output to the motor by getting things from the, from the, from the track, et cetera. What Steve's used is a whole different technology in these RC cars where they've got a controller and a little chip and that outputs to the motor. And it's all kind of this very low cost system, but it's kind of one-on-one -on -one control. You don't get all the things you get with DCC. So it's a beautiful system for that. But in the end, they both do the same thing to control the motor. The difference is in the cars, because they're very low power, they don't need more than 3.7 volts to be able to run really fast across the floor. The ones you're buying that are 30 bucks, I mean, they're, they're pretty cheap and they're not. If you go out and you buy the big Tamaya ones, that they run outdoors and they run in races and stuff, those will use a 12 volt motor because they need more power and you have to raise the voltage. But those, that equipment in the end is going to cost you as much or more than DCC. Right. That's a lot of space. And it's most a lot of space. So, so it's, it's a trade-off that it, it just, there's a real sweet spot for the, the car-based system in ON30 if you want a very low-cost, lots of engines wireless system or battery powered system it's actually it's it's really smart i mean it's really smart but i think that you got what you got to do is analyze and say here's my criteria right i i either do or do not have a layout I either do or do not have dcc you know i'd want to maintain my do i want to maintain my layout for other things how many locomotives do i already have that run in one of those two environments and then decide what do you want to do for battery power if you're starting and building a layout from scratch, it's an interesting concept. Let me let me ask my question a different way here. I have an HO layout. I have a small HO engine. Uh, if it gets 3.7 volts, I'm a happy camper with the speed. Probably not. I don't think that's enough voltage. 3.7 volts, it, it'll go probably 10 or 15 miles an hour is all. It's going to go slow. Will not power up a mobile. Yeah. I know. Well, no, it, it, the whole point is, guys, the tw the engines are built so when you go from zero from zero volts DC to twelve volts DC, they go through a speed range, and they hit their maximum speed at twelve volts. So if you go, if you assume that that speed range is relatively linear, if you go from twelve volts to six volts, you go from the maximum speed the engine will run at to half that speed. Right. Go from if you go from six volts to three volts, it's going to go down to a quarter of the maximum speed. So, you know, if the engine is designed to run at 90 miles an hour on 12 volt DC, 
on 3.7 volts, it's going to run 25 miles an hour maximum. It's not linear. There's a lot more voltage. It's, it's not. It's not linear. There's more voltage at the start to get it started too. Right. That's what. I was and saying. to get it get it creepy. But, but anyway, my my point is, it's just 3.7 volts, which just I think is going to be very very little. The so 12 volts. Really, so really, what we're saying is. Forget the car that Steve uh, took apart because that's not feasible for anything. No, it works well for the ON30s, where, yeah, the right. way Steve is using it. It works well for those because those engines, well, they run, they, most people only run those at about 20 or 30% of power. But, 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 you know, that's the HO engine that I'm talking about. That's the motor that I'm talking about, uh, Phil. Yeah, you'd have to try it and see. Like I said, I think the difference with the ON30 is the ON30 stuff was built to run relatively fast. Then let, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase what my question is. I'm an ON30 modeler, and I have a small, very small four-wheel switcher. Porter, yep. With an HO motor in it. Yes. And I've got a 3D printed, O scale body on it. So I'm an ON30 model. Right. And I take the units that Steve bought for the race car and I put them in a 3D printed gondola and I hook the two wires to the motor inside the, the engine. Will that run that engine? Satisfactory? Yes. Absolutely. I've oh, done it no times on, on, on Steve, now, Cheryl, now. and Steve Fisher's lad. It will run the engine. It's not going to run it fast, but it'll run the engine. I didn't say fast. I'm saying I'm happy at, at 15 miles an hour. I'm happy with that. It'll, on, it'll on work. Third. It'll work. All right. Now, if that same engine and ON30, same layout, same everything, except I got DCC instead of straight DC that I'm running on the engine now okay will that will that race car still work for me run my dcc and my motor on no. that in that engine no 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 you'd have to disconnect the motor from the dcc from the decoder and hook it into the rc receiver therefore if i go from uh dcc Equip locomotives now to battery power. I lose DCC. Period. Right. Yes. Therefore, if I use battery power, I'm I have to go straight DC with zero sound. There's and and zero lights because I've lost DCC. Is that right? There's no. probably a way to wire it up. If you isolate the um, DCC circuit from the motor and it's just running the sound and your pickups aren't going to the motor, you could probably have both. Yeah, you could just put a, uh, basically you put like a, maybe like a double pole, double throw switch in and you'd be switching back and forth between one or the other, depending on what you want to do. So, so, I, so if, I have, if, if, that, if, if I use that, then I'm using track power sometimes and battery power sometimes. Correct. You could also you could also wire it where the DCC has no control or no ability to get to that motor. It's simply going to the encoder, and the encoder is feeding the sound, and then you wire your battery system directly to the DC uh, to the motor. So you have basically onboard two systems. You could do that simultaneously. Yeah. How do I power the DCC? Right off the track. You just Through the track. The only, the only difference is your encoder no longer feeds the motor. Your motor is now but fed I, by the wireless. So I still have to have track power. If you want DCC, if you want sound like that, DCC sound. Right. So if I go to battery power and I don't want to have track power connected at all, I, I'm, I just cut all my wires, throw them away. Yeah, hundred percent battery power, and I've got to run straight DC. Period. You mean straight battery is what you're after? Well, yeah, but but I mean I can't go DCC because you just said you removed all the wiring. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
I have no wiring at all. So, so my back power will only operate the motor, which means that I, I'm going from battery power, my motor is straight DC because I can't have DCC with battery power unless I keep track power for the DCC. Well, there's, you'd have to talk to these guys, but there's probably analog sound at some point somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got DC, uh, no, uh, look, I've got battery power with sound. Without any track wiring. Without any track wiring, I've got battery power with sound. I have, now, it's not the RC car, it's another system that is very reasonable and it's very simple to hook up. I think when you hear Loco Fi next week, you're going to see that he has that system. Blumami is that system. Uh, um, CBP is, is that system. Okay. You know, there are systems out there, and we're talking about what I have is non sound, basic battery power for small engines. Everything else you want is going to cost you more, and it gives you more things that you can do with your engine. But you cannot have DCC and battery out of the same unit. You can have DCC. You, you can have. You can, battery, you can have. And you, you can have, have. You can have DCC through Bunami and battery power. So, Bob and Steve, can I give you guys a challenge to talk to next week? So it seems to me that the biggest missing piece in all of this discussion is I've got power on the track, either DCC power or DC power. So there is power on the track, but I'd like to go to a battery because that lets me do interesting things. For example, it's really easy to have power on straight sense of track and leave all your turnouts unpowered. That's about, to me, that gets you about 80% of the value or you have some tracks that are powered so, you know, what we need is a chipset or a module that's small and cost effective that you can wire off the tracks. It'll take DC or DCC from the tracks, convert it, manage a battery effectively, have the circuits necessary to charge and manage a battery effectively, and then provide an output to whatever the device is, whether it's a Bunami or it's a LocoFi or it's whatever. I mean, well, all we need is that one modular circuit that sits between the battery, the track, and whatever the control system is. And if you have that and drop that in an engine, then it's over. It's really easy because now you put the engine on the track. If the track's powered, it'll continue to keep the battery charged. If you've got, you know, you get all your yard tracks powered, no turnouts powered, everything works fine because the power when it's running is coming from the battery, but it can charge the battery whenever it's on a powered track. And to me, that seems like that's if you guys could, could come up with where that is, I've been able to find that. But to me, that's that's kind of nirvana uh, because well, you have the best of all worlds. Yeah, I agree with you. But I, I thought that one of the big draws of battery powered is to eliminate all the track wiring. But, but here's the thing is, Bob, to put if, if I've got a layout and I've got a yard and I've got five, four yard tracks or I've got a main yard, main line track, to drop a couple of lead drops off each of those tracks, I'm, draw, I'm drilling in and putting in 20 wires. I wire them all together and wire them to a big honking DC supply, and I'm done. There's no control. I don't, I don't wire any of the turnouts. I don't worry about any frog wiring. Because that's all being done on that. Are, are you wiring any of the main line? I, I would probably wire some of the main line just so you got the charging there. But you could make the decision that engines spend enough time in these track areas that they always stay charged. It just it eliminates the handling and the charging process, which to me was always the downside. I mean, if I look at battery power, there's only two downsides to it. The size of the components, which in ON30 is not an issue. And the fact that you've got to do something to charge them before you use them to make sure they're charged. You know, if it's charging is just kind of automatic as they move across the layout, you take that problem away, then it's just a matter of can you fit the components in. And like I said, the only thing you need to make that work 
is that one module. And I, I don't see anybody building it. It just amazes me. It's, uh, to me, it seems like, you know, an unbelievably simple um, business opportunity for one of these little companies that builds electronic components. And then you, you know how to manage a battery. Um, you know, the batteries have the, man they have the circuits to manage the charging of the batteries. And the rest is just a couple of rectifiers and an output. Steve, for me, the benefit of battery power is only one benefit. I don't have to clean track. Right. I don't have to clean my overhead. I don't have to clean the wheels of a locomotive. And my trains will run beautifully. To, yep. me, to me, that's why battery power would be attractive. It's just an added benefit if they can get charged with with Phil saying, you know, so you don't have to, but that's just an added benefit. Exactly. It's, it's not necessary. It's not necessary, but it's a it's an option. No, no absolutely. Yep, yeah. right. yeah, absolutely. And and that option is great as long as I don't have to clean any track to have it. Because for me, that would be my draw to battery power. Never have to clean the track or the overhead wire again. Right. And the, um, yeah, I guess we're going to learn about the Blue NAMI, but the advantage of DCC till I know about Blue NAMI is, you know, I can run a whistle, a chug, a brake noise. You know, I, at any time I can call a sound up on a sound equipped locomotive on my DCC. Well, I, I assume the Blue NAMI thing is the same thing, but I don't know. The, bl the Blue NAMI is, and, and the Blue NAMI has all of the engine EMF feedback stuff. So like, like, you know, if when, when my, in my locomotives, when you're going uphill, you get more chuff because the EMF is greater. Yeah. If you come over the top of the hill and you start going downhill, the chuff goes away and you get rod clank. That's just like cool. you would in a regular locomotive. So, and, and by the way, if you run diesels, I mean, the diesels, you can make it amazingly prototypical in operation with those things because you know, they'll do the feedback. What's really interesting, if you've ever done it with, and I've done this with the with an economy, blue NAMI, or not blue, economy, tsunami, but uh, if you, you put acceleration and momentum on the engine. So acceleration basically says yeah. how much the engine resists starting at the beginning. So when you turn the throttle on, and normally in a DC engine, when you turn it on, you immediately start going fast. If you put acceleration from zero to 128, it goes up to 256. When you turn the engine on, you can turn it up to 50% and it won't move for half a quarter of a second. Yeah, and then it'll do. slowly accelerate. Yeah. What's really, yeah, what's really interesting is when you, on mine, when you turn it up, if you turn it all the way up to a speed setting of 128 and it is not moving, it won't move. What happens is the chuff sound gets really, really loud. And then as it starts going faster, you turn the speed down back to about 30, which is about 25 to 30 is kind of the running speed for those guys. And what you find is when you do that, then the chuffs get very quiet. And so, yeah, you get some very interesting sound effects with these decoders that, um, you know, are tied to how the locomotive is actually running. And, you know, and like I said, if you turn on momentum, then when you go to stop, you turn the engine off, you go to zero, the engine will roll for six feet. So on the tsunami or again, the blue NAMI, if you hit function 11, that's the brake. And what it'll do is it'll turn on the brake, and that does two things. You get a brake squeal, just like the brakes are being turned on. And the engine will decelerate faster than it would if you didn't have the brakes on. So, you know, they, they do some pretty amazing stuff in DCC if you play with it a little bit. So I now, whether or not I, that's important to you is another question. So I think yeah. I've got a solution for the battery charging problem. I'm going to print a larger gondola that will handle a 12-volt car battery. <laughs> it'll last a long time. It won't go anywhere, but it'll last a long time. No, that's good. It, 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 it's a great idea, though. It's just, it's just you know, I, I think Steve's idea of figuring out where to put a plug to plug in with a simple, you know, microphono jack was a great idea, too. I mean, just put that on the, you know, on the back of the engine where you don't have to take it off the track. Yeah, well, the... Um, uh our friend kevin hunter who does touch toggles yeah uh, he actually purchased some magnetic couplers and uh you know it would be very easy to mount these magnetic couplers let's say on the back side of a uh, gondola or back side of a uh, tender 
and then have a charging station where you would actually back into that charging station. It would made up with the other uh, magnetic coupler. It would charge through that coupler. And then uh, that way you don't have to touch anything. You just have to be very careful about backing into it. That's a neat idea too. Well, listen yeah. guys, this has gone on a little long tonight. Uh, so why don't we carry this on uh, next week? Uh, 